Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura, and um, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, as, as, as Laura mentioned at the beginning, um, there will be a lot of talk about rice, uh, and I will be the culprit for that, uh, since I'll be mostly be talking about rice today before we hand over to Noel for to, to diversify the, the, the products a little bit. So um, I want to present today um, the case um, for producing sustainable rice in, in Africa um, as compared to, to importing um, all that rice from, from Asia. And in the next um, maybe 10 minutes, maybe a little more, you will, you will hear um, um, yeah, this case and, and how we are planning on doing this and how we already embarked on the, that process. And um, towards the end, I will also touch upon how to, to valorize um, the, the side products or the co-products um, during the rice uh, production and processing um, process. So with that, I would jump right in and um, go to the next slide. And um, this is probably one of my, my favorite slides, um, as it is a little shocking, or it was a little shocking to me when I, when I first saw it, um, since most of the time, um, yeah, the global community always talks about um, the beef industry as the big, the big perpetrator of greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, while this is true, I personally was was fairly surprised uh, when I saw the, the the bubble that that follows right on the left hand side, right after beef, uh, which is rice, and and that rice is actually a huge contributor to to global uh, greenhouse gases. And uh, most of these these gases um, are methane. Which is even a more powerful gas than, than carbon, carbon dioxide. It's 28 or 29 times more powerful, um, and there's a lot of that in, in rice production. So this is this is what explains the the big bubble um, we see here for rice. Which then that that means um, you know if you look at the global landscape of rice, it means that rice is is both uh, as, as Laura mentioned at the beginning, it's both a, a perpetrator but also a victim of climate change. On the one hand, they they really trigger climate change through those emissions. At the same time, um, rice farmers are quite often the victim of um, drought, of erratic rainfall, um, salination issues, um, since some rice, especially in Asia, is cultivated close to the, to the shores, um, pests and diseases, and all these other things that are, that are triggered by climate change. So we see a, a, a picture here um, of, of rice um, at a global scale which, which and the, the numbers are quite telling here that uh, 3.5 billion people rely on rice for the diet. Um, at the same time, rice is a big, big uh, driver of habitat loss across the world, um, especially in wetlands and forests. And it's also really responsible for, and this is a typo here, um, it's responsible for 10% of global methane emissions. Um, so we have to take out uh, the 2%, but nevertheless, 10% is, is quite the number, I would say. And now when we move, move to Africa, um, in Africa or West Africa specifically, we have about 20 million farmers. And um, yeah, the, the demand is, is really not met through local production, and that leads to, to the issue of lacking self-sufficiency in Africa overall, but specifically in West Africa that also my, my co-speaker Bola Dale will, will touch upon later. Um, and yeah, the consumption is estimated to, to increase over the coming years, which makes this whole situation even more um, yeah, um, stressed, I would say. So maybe to the next slide, Anya. So what we at, at MOVE, um, or as previously we were called um, CARI, um, have done over the, couple, the last couple of years is that we started con conversing with the Sustainable Rice Platform that is a multi-actor um, alliance um, based in, in Bangkok, Thailand. And um, they essentially have yeah, the mission to mainstream sustainable rice cultivation practices across the world, starting in Asia, but they specifically have a global, global um, vision and mandate to really um, push the concept of sustainability in rice production um, in, in order to, yeah, essentially, um, um, yeah, work on the challenges that I, I mentioned in my previous slide. So they really try to tackle the concept of SRP um, from the environmental, social, and economic um, aspect. And um, this is how we, yeah, started conversing to SRP in, in, a, in the framework of a South-South exchange um, concept. And we wanted to bring some of the innovations to, to West Africa specifically, and also East Africa and Tanzania. So next slide, please. Um, so here, a few brief words of what SRP 
is or or offers. So the, the we have the SRP, which is an entity as a platform, but then they also developed the SRP standard, which is a, a voluntary sustainability standard, um, which essentially tells you what are the right practices to follow. Um, there are uh, 49 different practices. They are organized into eight different um, topical issues. And essentially, it's a standard that that ranges from zero to one hundred, and you can you can calculate um, the adoption of sustainable rice cultivation practices, and then based on 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 that calculation, you can see where you where you lie on the spectrum um, in terms of the compliance. Um, the entry point is usually thirty three percent. This is uh, at which point you are as a farmer or a company that works with uh, farmers are considered that you are working towards sustainable rice cultivation. Um, all the way until you hit the 90% and that's when you can claim um, to be um, fully sustainable um, in, in your cultivation practices. Um, this is quite an ambitious target. Of course, in the African context, most farmers are in more in the light green um, section of, of this spectrum um, and they're working towards sustainability. But in, in Asia, um, there are farmers that have achieved the full, full, full level and then you can also start, um, yeah, claiming claiming that for uh, marketing reasons. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just quickly to show everybody um, how it looked like in practice. Um, essentially, we, we took our existing um, manuals for farmer trainings and upgraded them to reflect the entire content of SRP, which is, I think, important to 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 mention because um, we don't want to sell it as a as a substitution of the very common good agronomic practices that we are promoting in um, in, in in Africa. So it's essentially just an, an upgrade where we added the social and environmental um, dimensions and have sort of calibrated a little bit the economic aspects of the training manual. But this is this is pretty much uh, what it looks like our manual in in Nigeria, but we also have manuals in other countries where our project works. Um, the next slide um, would then show us one of the key innovations, for instance, that we have brought from um, Asia to, to Africa, that is the, the technique of alternate wetting and drying. It's a very, very simple, very straightforward uh, technique where, where you just take a, take, a, um, take a plastic cube, like the one you see it on the picture here. This is um, for the ones that speak Swahili here. This is <laughs> taken from our our training manuals in Tanzania. Um, and essentially, this tube, when you like sort of drill the holes correctly, allows you to to monitor the water level in your rice field, and um, that essentially is a is a very low cost tool for for smart water management. And as you will also see later in one of my slides, the the water manages management is is really uh, the key driver of methane emissions in in rice production. Um, so this. Briefly, in terms of the one of the many innovations we have we have yeah upgraded our manuals with. There was also integrated pest management, laser leveling, and those things. Of course, laser laser leveling is is yeah quite often constrained by by just simply the, the access to the technology. So again, it's a long journey to progress on that SRP standard um, uh, in order to be fully fully sustainable. Um, next slide, please. And um, since we're also talking about um, yeah the the business case for for sustainable uh, products and climate resilient products, SAP in addition to the standard, they've also developed a um, an assurance scheme um, to verify compliance um, of SRP. There's three different levels. Um, there's level one that is focused on self assessment. There's level two that is a second party verification, but it's sort of associated with the farmer. And then the level three, which is the most sophisticated level of verification, um, is done by an independent body, and this is done in collaboration with Global Gap. And uh, once you hit level three, you can actually use it, um, yeah, for for marketing claims, as I said earlier, and uh, possibly also, um, yeah, claim or or obtain premiums for the sustainably produced rice, and um, as as we all know in, in the US and in Europe, but also in other regions in the world, the consumer preferences are, are shifting um, towards um, fair trade and sustainable um, products. So SRP is, is one avenue um, for rice here. And I think on the next slide, 
I just wanted to briefly show how how a um, SRP verified product looks like. Unfortunately, in Africa, we are not quite yet at the stage where um, we have SRP verified rice. This is an example of rice that is sourced from um, India and then sold in a German supermarket, um, specifically that's um, Lidl, without particularly promoting this rice. But you see the SRP verified label there, and um, hopefully, um, you know, in the yeah not so far away future, we can start tackling that aspect also in in Africa. Even though there the market, of course, looks very different because for rice at least it's not export oriented. So you also need to start sensitizing the consumers um, within the continent um, for sustainable aspects, which is a big topic of of today's conference. And um, yeah, with that, I would want to um, go to my next topic. I, I hope I managed to at least build a little bit the the case for for um, yeah why we should um, cultivate um, yeah rice sustainably. Um, it is a perpetrator and the victim of of um, climate change, and hopefully we can we can move into a good direction in the future. So now an additional point um, that's I think very interesting and has a lot of relevance for also policy making, um, not at the national but also the regional level, um, is the, the the measurement of the carbon footprint and how we can shift the burden by by valorizing um, the co-products or you know some people call it side products, waste products, depending on on what specific product we're talking about here. And if we go to the next slide. Um, just briefly to mention that move um, in 2020, I believe, or 19, we did a life cycle assessment um, of rice. And um, life cycle assessment is essentially just a, a fairly established methodology to measure um, yeah, the environmental footprint of a product. Um, in this case, it was rice. Uh, in principle, it can also be um, the chair you're sitting on or any other commodity, be it agricultural or um, yeah, industrial. It goes through the entire life cycle, starting from um, using the, the inputs for the cultivation part, then um, growing it, processing it, transporting it, um, you know, further further refining it and adding value for it until it reaches the end consumer, and it's an eventually um, disposal or or food consumption, as in the case of of food products. That is the life cycle assessment, and and we conducted that. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we will see some more of the details of this study. So essentially, we wanted to compare rice that is uh, grown or produced processed and consumed in Nigeria, and specifically Lagos, um, we want to compare this case with um, the import. Essentially, rice that is grown, processed in Vietnam, and then shipped from Vietnam to uh, Nigeria, Lagos um, for consumption. And we want to see how that compares from an environmental footprint point of view. Um, we chose Vietnam uh, mostly because uh, Vietnam uh, imports or exports in this case a lot to Nigeria, and Lagos, of course, is is the biggest the biggest market in in uh, Nigeria. So next slide, please. Um, so these were the results, and um, I think they were quite telling, to be honest. Um, on the on the left hand side, we look at one kg of raw rice, uh, of paddy rice. And this is measured in, in CO2 um, equivalents. And we see all the different things. So this is essentially the cultivation phase of rice, right? And so the rice has not been processed here yet on the left hand side. And um, we see all the different um, activities and aspects that contribute to the overall um, calculation of emissions. But we see one big uh, section of the bar that, that contributes the most and where we see the most telling difference between Vietnam and Nigeria. And that is um, yeah, CH4, which is methane. As mentioned earlier, methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And this is really where the key difference comes in and what appears to make Nigerian rice that is produced um, locally um, more climate friendly. And the big reason for this is that the, the rice fields in Asia are usually produced with um, or use a lot of water since the fields are continuously flooded most of the growing season. 
And um, what happens is when you don't get rid of the, the organic material from the previous season, which is the rice stubble and other organic matter, and then you flood the field, there's an inorganic decomposition process that is essentially triggering methane emissions. And partially because of following good practices, partially by default because there's more water scarcity in Africa, uh, we don't see the, those high levels of emissions because um, there's less water um, used or farmers wait longer um, to flood the fields because, first of all, it's costly to, to pump water into the fields or there might not be that much rainfall, fall, but at the same time, they're a little more um, cautious about the water use. So this is what explains the big difference in, in the carbon footprint uh, when comparing Nigeria and rice. And then when you even move to the, the right-hand side of this, this chart, where you look at the final product that is, that is 1 kg of, of processed white, white rice, because quite often we think it's transportation that is actually the big trigger of, of emissions. But in this particular case, we see that the, the green part, that is essentially the cultivation phase, that is what is really um, contrib or contributing the most to the carbon footprint. And transport um, plays a way more minor role. Um, I don't want to say it's negligible, but it's way smaller. And um, really working on, on good practices on the field to me personally, at least, it seems that it's the, the low-hanging fruit to, to really cut the emissions. And it's a really strong case for growing rice um, in Africa and really driving import substitution. Um, has a lot of implications also on food security, as we now also um, see um, in the different crises we have uh, across the world during the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, some Asian countries initially also issued export bans, uh, which also put stress on a lot of African countries. Uh, now we have a fertilizer crisis and so on. So I think there's there's lots of different arguments to be made um, to produ produce rice um, locally, but ideally also sustainably. Um, and with that, I would like to move to another, and this is my last final point for, for my slides, is another aspect on this, which is how we can distribute the burden of that carbon footprint um, evenly. And when you measure the carbon footprint of a final product that is rice, um, it's about how you attribute the, or allocate the economic value of that product. Now, if um, you don't use all the side products from rice economically, the entire environmental burden is shifted to the final product of rice, which means in this particular case, um, you close to 95% to probably of the burden is allocated to rice, the white rice. Now, if you put the side products of rice to productive use, and there's essentially three main uh, side products. There. We have rice, rice, the straw from the rice cultivation part, this is at the farm level. And then when we process the, the raw rice, we, we get the rice husk, which is the shell, and then the rice bran, which is sort of the, the outer layer of the kernel. And at least in Africa right now, the straw and the husk is not really being utilized. The bran a little bit um, for to as livestock feed, um, so that is being put to productive use a little bit. But the rust, the husk is just sitting next to the rice mills on a big pile um, and not just just rotting away. Uh, the straw is actually being burned. Um, <laughs> you get more emissions from that. So now, if you start putting those um, side products to to productive use, um, it can be a win-win because you shift the, the 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 footprint away from the from the the final product that is rice but you also start to 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 put those side products to productive use so they're not wasted away and this is where we've done a lot of pilots and i think this is also where it fits nicely into the presentation that is to follow from noel what can you do with with these side products and and with that i, I would go to my last slide um where we wanted to show um a little bit at least what we've done so far. Most of these things are pilots and they're very simple activities, but they, I think they can be um, pretty powerful in the sector um, as we creatively come, try to come up with how to fix climate change uh, and how to drive the adoption of good practices. So um, here we've seen a, a fairly straightforward practice um, what to do with the rice straw that is essentially silage. Um, it's good for the for the livestock. Um, in an ideal case, um, the farmer who makes it um, gets some money for it. The straw is readily available and for free. 
Same with the rice husk. Um, in the middle at the bottom, we have a gasifier that creates um, a little flame out of the, the, um, the rice husk, but, but in a more environmentally friendly way without having too much emissions. And my personal favorite is, is the, the bricketing machine that is uh, solar powered um, on the top left. Um, there we put the rice husk with a few other um, on-farm um, inputs into the machine. It sources its energy from, from um, the sun. And then on the right hand side, you see the, the output that is um, rice husk briquettes, um, which are more energy efficient and they can use, be used either in, um, you know, at home when you cook, um, or even um, yeah, industrially, um, you know, for parboiling women, when they parboil the rice, they can fire um, fire the pot. Um, and this way, I mean, we were just recently, for instance, in Ghana in the field, a lot of the parboiling women continue to to collect wood from the from the forest. They cut down trees um, because there's no other material available. So these things, um, I think, um, can be a great avenue to to also. Um, lower the issue or fight the issue with deforestation um and yeah this is this is my case for um yeah growing on the one hand growing uh, rice sustainably in africa and um and, and 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 driving import substitution but at the same time also really start thinking creatively um on what we can do with the side products and with that i would hand over back to you laura and um thank you for listening